So this morning, I wanted to talk about this, this uh, idea, this image that comes up over and over again in the Bible, seeds, plants, growth. And I want us to think about it in terms of our own context today. I'm going to start out with this image and ask you a question. What do you think is in the middle ground? So we've got the background here, and this is uh, in Israel, by the way. We've got the background. We've got the foreground. What does the middle ground look like? You're probably thinking a lot of the same. It's right in between, right? Let me tell you that they've done something to this, the land in the middle ground. It's something called drip irrigation. You guys thought you were coming to church, but it, it's going to be agricultural class. <laughs> They did drip irrigation, and that's where you drip, drip, drip water in the same place, and it allows you to reduce the amount of evaporation. What can you do with drip irrigation in the middle of a desert? Well, you can grow a vineyard. It's pretty amazing. Human ingenuity has done a wonderful thing and allowed people to grow a vineyard in the middle of a desert. We're going to cover these ideas this morning. Deep growth requires steady nourishment. Growth can happen in challenging circumstances. Growth can happen even when we aren't looking. What kinds of challenges are we going through as a church? What kind of challenges are we going through as individuals, as families. I know things aren't easy these days, but I want to bring us hope. I want to bring us hope. We're going to go through uh, a story. We're going to talk about Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. Then we're going to ask a couple of questions. What does faithfulness look like? And how does faithfulness grow? Then we're going to come back to our reading, The Vine and the Branches, and then we're going to put things into practice right at the end. So let's talk about John called Mark. So I guess in biblical times, people always had two names. You know, my name's Emmanuel, but people call me M. Um, John was his name, but people called him Mark. Who was this guy? So a lot of uh, his scholars uh, will say that Mark was the author of the Gospel of Mark, and he wrote down the Gospel as he was told by Peter. So we know that in his later years, Mark was certainly somebody that was well-versed, somebody who was dependable and had a connection with the people older than him. When it comes to us actually reading about him in the Bible, he only comes up a few times in Acts 12, and then in 2 Timothy. So in Acts 12, let's set the stage. Peter escapes from prison, and he retreats to a house of Christians, and that happens to be the, mother, the, the house of John Mark's mother, Mary. So we know that John Mark, he was this guy who was kind of growing up in the faith. Sounds a lot like Timothy, who you guys talked about last week. He was kind of growing up in, in the midst of this church family, this emerging church. Then he goes into the growth stage, Acts 12, 25. So Paul and Barnabas, they're going on their missionary journey, and they say, you know what? We want to bring some, some young people with us. And among them is John Mark. We don't know all the details, but we know that John Mark eventually created a conflict between, between Paul and Barnabas. Now let's think about the people that were there. We've got uh, Paul and Barnabas. These guys would have been uh, a little bit older, but they would be on, they're on, kind of on fire for God. You know, Paul has just been, he's a newly minted apostle. <laughs> And he's ready to go on a missionary journey. Go, let's preach to all the other synagogues. we got to tell people that the Christ has come. 
They're a little bit more mature, but they've got that fire in them. Then they've got these young guys among them, John Mark. And we don't know why, but John Mark didn't make it through that first missionary journey. And then Paul and Barnabas ended up kind of fighting. Barnabas said, no, we need to go get him. We need to bring him back. And Paul said, you know what? We don't have the time. I can't do it. <laughs> or at least that's what we think. That Paul said, you know what? I, I don't have the energy to put into that. We've got a mission. Let's, let's get going. And so they eventually parted ways. We know that Paul ended up with Silas, and Barnabas ended up with John Mark. Now flash forward to 2 Timothy. And Paul is writing the, the, these epistles from a very different place. Maybe he's not in his 40s anymore. Maybe now he's in his 60s. He's in the twilight of his years. And with age comes wisdom. <laughs> and now, John Mark, he's not this young guy of 20 anymore. Now, John Mark is maybe in his 30s, 40s. And Paul asked Timothy, bring, bring John Mark for he is very useful to me for ministry. What happened? What happened in the years in between that changed? Where Paul went from saying, I don't have time for this guy, we gotta get going, to now he's him saying, bring Mark, for he's useful to me in ministry. Let's jump into our first question. What does faithfulness look like? As we think about our story, Paul, Barnabas, John, or John Mark, all of them have different roles in that story. But none of them are more or less faithful than the others. Was Barnabas any better or worse than Paul for saying, no, we should go back and, and raise this guy up? No? Was John Mark less faithful because he got discouraged? No, that was just part of what was happening, where he was at that moment. Faithfulness doesn't look or sound just one way. And I'll pick on Peter because I know Peter. A lot of us will look at Peter and we'll say, oh, you know what, look at Peter, he's great. He can come up here and he can preach and he can lead singing and lead us in the fellowship room, and no, ma no matter what you throw at Peter, he's going to be great. <laughs> Sometimes we think we need to be like Peter, but we don't. <laughs> God wants us to be us, and we, no matter who we are or where we're at, can be a minister for God. Faithfulness is our vocation. It's our calling but it's not always our occupation. If I ask you what you do to make your money today, I'm sure we have, you know, dozens of answers for the dozens of people that are here. We make our money in one way, but what are we called to do as Christians? Live a faithful life. And we need to recognize that there are moments and seasons to our faithfulness. How many in this auditorium have been Christians for more than five years? How many have been Christians for more than 10 years? 20 years? Maybe I'll stop asking now. <laughs> but we've got... We've got a wealth, a wealth of experience in this congregation. We've got a wealth of experience of faithfulness in the wider church. We need to recognize that that faithfulness has different seasons to it. And we need to tell each other about the different seasons of our faithfulness. For those of you who are more mature in the faith, I ask you, Please, tell those who are less mature. Tell them what it's like 
when you were quiet and felt God's presence. Tell the children about the times when you were loud and you were serving God. Tell the teenagers when you've lamented and you were calling out to God. Tell the new parents that there will be a time of rejoicing, just not when the baby's waking you up at two in the morning. There are moments and seasons to our faithfulness, and we really, really need to understand that and embrace it. Faithfulness does not mean you have to do everything, but we need to be honest about what we are doing. Am I doing what I can do? And if you can answer yes, then praise God. These are just some self-reflection questions. I won't ask you to answer them, but I'll just read them out. How do I usually express faithfulness? What are different ways that I or others express faithfulness? And do I sometimes put limits on what I allow myself to be called to do? Our brother this morning uh, during Bible class said that when he was first to preach approach to teach Bible class, he said, no, I'm not. (laughs) I'm not going to do that. I've been in that seat where somebody asked me, hey, will you be willing to to serve in this way? And my first answer was, no, I I can't do that. (laughs) But what happens when we allow ourselves to be open, open to God calling us? How does faithfulness grow? This is our second question. Let's think about that, that, that story again. John, Mark, Paul, Barnabas. What does that mean? How can we answer that question using that story? Well, what the lesson that I see is that sometimes you need to be patient for yourself, and sometimes you need to be patient for others. When I was a young man, I think I can say that when I was a young man. When I was a young man, um, the preacher at our home congregation, he said, he was from Ohio, so I'm going to try an Ohio accent. He said, Em, I got time on Sunday nights. (laughs) And I, I turned to him and I said, What do you mean? Yeah, we've all got time on Sunday nights. What's happening? (laughs) He said, well, I got an open, open preaching spot. Would you like to take it? (laughs) Of course I said, "Uh, (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if I can handle this. But he encouraged me. And so for about a year, once a month, I was up there, and I was preaching on Sunday nights in front of a small group of our members. And let me tell you, those first sermons were awful. (laughs) They were unpolished, really tough to follow, but they were patient with me. They were patient with me. They said, you know what? Keep going. Stick with it. And eventually, I got a little better. And hopefully I'm doing okay today. You know? (laughs) I'm getting a thumbs up back there. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes we need to be patient with ourselves. Sometimes we need to be patient with others. Where would I have, where would I be if I had not been patient with myself in growing and if those others hadn't been patient with me? Just a side story, when I went up and did my first Sunday morning sermon, instead of it being a group of maybe 20 people, it was a group of maybe 150, 200. And so uh, I got up and I was really excited and I looked over and uh, that preacher that was over there, I looked over ready for a big smile and he was falling asleep. (laughs) But that's okay, he'd done his time. 
You know, sometimes we tend to focus on the moment at hand. And what we don't realize is that people and circumstances change. People and circumstances change. And faithful growth happens the same way. It happens in due time. Faithful growth happens in due time. We're not all meant to grow very quickly. Some of us are. But it is in our due time, in God's time. How does faithfulness grow? Some reflection questions. What did my spiritual life look like two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, for those who are more mature, 25 years ago? What did my church family look like 10 years ago? What changes may have gone on over a gradual period? And which ones may have happened quickly? Faithfulness grows in due time. So let's come back to the vine and branches. I'm going to read this one more time very quickly. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Actually, we'll stop it there. So the vine and branches, it's again this, I, this, this symbol of life, of growth. As we think about that idea with John Mark, it really strikes that idea that we're connected, but not all the time. People can grow even when they're out of my eyesight. God's kingdom can grow even when I'm not there. And how does it grow? It grows because our mutual relationship with the Father is the heart of the kingdom. Our mutual relationship with the Father is the heart of the kingdom. That means that, you know, we certainly do have a responsibility to one another as members of the, of the church. We're there to support one another. We're there to balance one another. We're there to reach out and reach higher with one another. But John Mark, in that story, he, he didn't continue with Paul, but he continued to be nourished and grew to be a, be a great benefit to the church because he was connected to the vine. Because he was connected to the vine. And unless we all are connected to the vine, we're not going to grow. And we need to remember that, that we're not just a club <laughs> of, of people that get together, but we're brought here together because we are all connected to the vine. So this is the second agricultural reference. <laughs> so we talked about drip irrigation. Now I want to talk about farmer-managed natural regeneration. And this is something that happens in areas where things get clear-cut. That means they, they cut down all the trees. And there's two ways to kind of manage that. One way is you cut everything down, and then you grow a bunch of saplings, and then you plant the saplings row after row after row after row after row. And the truth is most of those saplings are not going to make it. That's if you just plant the saplings. But with this technique, farmer-managed natural regeneration, about 90% of trees make it. And how do they do it? What's the difference between planting a sapling and this, this technique here? This technique, and you can see in the picture, in the foreground, see how lush it is? That's because they've used farmer-managed natural regeneration. 
And in the background, it's still clear cut. It's just grass or dry. It's, it's going to erode. What they do with this technique is they use existing root systems. Doesn't that sound like the vine and branches? <laughs> that passage that we just talked about? It's almost as though God's word is inspired. <laughs> what they do in this, this technique is they'll walk into an area that's clear cut. And then they take a look at it and they say, OK, you know what? I see a tree over there. It's got a good root system. It's just, it's just a stump right now, but it looks pretty good. I see one over there, and I see one over there. So they take those, those trees that look good, then they take a piece, of, a piece of ribbon, and then they mark it. They say, these are my good trees. And then, what do they do? They protect it. So they, they see a cow coming, trying to eat the, the leaves. They shoo it away. Somebody wants to come down, and they want to cut down that tree for firewood. They say, no, don't you dare touch that tree. This is going to grow into something good. They protect it. Then the last thing that they do is they prune it. So every year or so, every six months or so, they come, they take a look at those candidates, and they say, you know what? This is kind of growing more into a bush. I'm going to prune the sides so that it can grow up to become a tree. And they repeat this process and repeat this process. And because they're using the existing root system. They're using trees that are already there. Most of these trees actually make it instead of these saplings where most of them fail. How is this like our church? Well, we just read it. We just read it in John. That's what God does with us. He surveys the land. He marks the candidates. All of us have been marked. And he's, he's protecting us. He's protecting us from the devil. <laughs> protecting us from the world that wants to eat us up. But he's also pruning us so that we can grow into something beautiful. Let's ask ourselves a question. As it is, who do I tend to attach myself to? The vine or the branches? As branches, have we been through any pruning that we might bear fruit? Questions to think about. So let's put this into practice really quickly, and then we'll wrap things up. The church is big enough that it can bear more fruit than any one or two people could on their own. If we are all activated as ministers for Christ, how much fruit can we bear? Recognizing our own and others' talents and opportunities this is really important as a church. Let's ask ourselves, what are one or two things that I can try? You know, I'm not going to be a song leader. That's OK. But you know what I can do? I can call somebody up and say, hey, how you doing this week? You want to go out for coffee? Can I encourage you? Can I be a blessing to you? Recognizing the different timelines. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to see our friends and family that are a little bit discouraged. And it's hard for us to go through that. But can't we be a blessing if we go to them and say, you know what? I've been discouraged too. But you know what? God's been faithful to me. And God will be faithful to you too. The different timelines that we're all on, that can be a blessing. 
Pointing others to God is more, benef- more beneficial than anything we could do alone. So in other words, when we try to replace God, when we try to replace God without connecting ourselves to God, we're going to fail. But when we're connected to God, then we can certainly grow. We can grow even in tough times. As long as we've got that steady nourishment, even in challenging circumstances, even when we aren't looking or others aren't looking at us, we can grow. So let's take this story of Paul, Barnabas, John, Mark. Let's recognize that faithfulness doesn't look only one way. Let's recognize that faithful growth happens in due time. And let's remember that faithfulness really means us being connected to the vine. The branches, we have a role to play, but the main thing is us being connected to the vine. So as I close this morning, I'll I'll close with an invitation. If you've heard the gospel, that Jesus died for your sins. That you believe, you want to repent of your sins, or say, God, yes, I will follow you. Yes, I will be connected to that vine. If you want to confess your faith, if you want to be baptized, or if you need some prayers because you're discouraged and you want to remain faithful, then please come to the front while we stand and sing our closing hymn without him.